And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Reconciled invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconciled.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Elliot Holland. He is with Guardian Due Diligence, and we're going to talk about everything about making your acquisition safe, doing due diligence, and what's happening in the market today. Thank you for being on the show today, Elliot. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. Let's have some fun. Yeah, let's have some fun here. Let's just jump right in with the origin story, man. And we were talking beforehand. You got some really cool background. You've got a lot of experience in this and started off with some of the best schools and stuff. So how did you end up in mergers and acquisitions? And I jokingly always say, like, you were born and you ended up on a show about mergers and acquisitions. Could you fill out the gap in between? No, absolutely. So crazy enough, I do the same kind of work my dad did. So oh. I actually have his SBA binder on a bookshelf around here. So I kind of got it, honestly. Both my parents were accountants, grew up in Detroit. And that era of Detroit business was very interesting. And so I, I went to school at Morehouse College and Georgia Tech. So they have a dual degree program. I got an engineering degree that I, I did a couple of internships and saw the mediocre business dudes were bossing the engineers around. So I had to get out of there. I did some strategy consulting and then I went to on this fancy place called Harvard for business school. And when I was at Harvard, I quickly realized, Ron, like I was poor. Like really poor. Like I segmented Harvard into three areas. Like the first were like so rich that it didn't matter if they ever worked the job in their life, they'd be set. So they're like, you're not competing with them. Then like some middle people had been to like two Ivy League schools, two bald rack and investment banks, working at a private equity firm, they knew Warren Buffett personally. You're not competing with them. So I'm in like the bottom third on the poor side. So I'm like, hey, I got to write this shit. So private equity initially was all about, mergers and acquisitions was all about making that Harvard degree work for me. And then when I got into it, I sort of realized quickly that a lot of the people in it don't actually own equity. <laughs> so a private equity general partner, the partners that you see, they don't own equity in the truest sense. They represent pension funds equity that they then put into deals for a management fee on an annual basis and 20% of the. And so I realized that the real game was owning equity. So I started at a family office doing private equity work. And then I spun out, I was an independent sponsor for a while. Then I was a self-funded searcher when my business partner kind of retired effectively. And this is around 2017, 2018. And I looked around and I saw all these new folks coming into the deal world. I saw kind of deal novices that hadn't run a company. Even bigger than that, Ron, you'll appreciate this. So like inside of companies, you have like this HR referee and like this brand name honor badge. So like I represent Coke, we don't lie. And if I do lie, HR is going to get me in trouble. So when I negotiate with you, it's very safe to assume it's in good faith. In an open air negotiation in the real world around business, it's almost like I'm a liar that's trained to negotiate and you <laughs> should be too. And so I saw these folks coming in that didn't recognize that and I thought they needed some help. So I started Guardian, A, because I thought the diligence solutions for small deals were kind of crappy, but B, I knew a lot of folks coming into the market would get fleeced without the right support. So kind of, I'm like a player coach. Yeah, I got a question for you real quick. The area of due diligence that you work with, is it just the financial side or like 
I'm just doing working on this article for one of our newsletters, and I didn't realize there's actually 10 segments, like 10 areas of yep. due diligence. It's financial, yep. legal, HR, operations. I won't name them all, but like what areas do you guys help with on the due diligence? Uh, so historically, we've done financial, primarily because and your audience is SMB folks. Nobody wants to pay. And I get it. I was a self-funded searcher. So once you start using all those other words, people just think you're trying to charge them and they turn off. But really, we're actually moving into being an investment bank for SMB deals. So right now we do three types of diligence. So we do financial, which is primarily the quality of earning. Then it's operational, which is all of the internal people and structures and processes that allow a business to make money. Like is Junior working in the business and will he ever work for a new owner? Or is the CFO dating the owner and so you inherit somebody that never had performance reviews? Or can the controller even count? You know what I mean? Is the salesperson doing sales or doing nefarious things to keep customers? So all those operational things. I, I laugh because one of my favorite questions for a small business owner is, what does your wife do? And because often I find out wife's doing the books and not drawing a salary for doing the books, right? Like. I look at an org chart and figure it out. You got a normal org chart for a business. And most of those roles are taken by somebody, whether they have the title or the pay payroll for it or not. Somebody's doing that role. Somebody's sure. doing sales. Somebody's doing accounting. Somebody's off managing the office. And then you got to figure out who's wearing those hats. Because I know for me as a new guy coming in, if I'm buying something, I don't want to wear all the hats, right? You don't want to be surprised how many hats the owner or the owner and the owner's wife or the owner and the owner's wife and like the main dude are doing and a big piece of operational is like figuring out what jobs to do what jobs does this business have to do sales operations accounting maybe not a full-time equivalent but has to do them and who's doing them so that's the operational stuff so financial operational and the commercial is the external industry environment and the internal sales office and how does the internal sales and marketing office interact with the outside industry world to generate outside return so are you going into an industry with tailwinds or headwinds are you doing better than average or worse than average from sales and marketing? Do you have processes and systems or is it some one dude that's been in it for 35 years, has got the hunting license and the, the seats to the freaking Dallas Cowboys. And as soon as that dude goes, you're done. So those are the pieces that we cover now. And increasingly I'm trying to be more communicative about that because we always sort of did them run. Just people just wanted the financial. Yeah, I looked at a business, it's been about three years now, two years ago, two and a half, three years ago. And the owner was a local, he's local pro, but he was a pro golfer. And he, he taught at one of the better golf courses in town. And I asked him, well, tell me your sales strategy. He goes, well, I just take the dealership owners out on the golf course, give them lessons as we play and then sell them our services. Like, I don't play golf, man. <laughs> he just knocked me exactly. right out of it. Like, you can exactly. hang around and do it. The funny thing was, that wasn't the deterring factor. The deterring factor is, you know, I'd be willing to stay on. As long as I got to work less, I said, cool. Well, what does working less look like? Yeah. If I could work only 40 hours a week, I'd be good. I'm like, how many hours a week are you working now? He's pulling 80, 90, 100 hour weeks and just wanted to drop back to 40. And so then you start looking at what hats are you wearing, right? And now the business doesn't look nearly as appealing because the profit margins got stuck up because you got a $80,000 a year operator. Now you need the accountant, you need the sales rep, you need all the other different stuff that he's just putting his hat, pulling in hours for and not paying himself for. Exactly. There's probably no margin in the business because by the time you hire two full-time equivalents to do some of the stuff he's doing, because it couldn't just be fit into one sort of Swiss army knife person's 80 hour week. And the people who are getting paid salary are not going to work as hard as the owner. Right. It eats up though, that those SDE dollars get eaten up real quick. And I'm not a big fan of SDE to begin with, but you got to be careful because these brokers are heading back everything, man. And then <laughs> fighting for it like you're a dummy just because you just showed up at the I'm doing deals convention. If it smells funky, it probably is. So what's some of the more interesting things you've found inside of that? Like you're doing due diligence, quality of earnings reports and stuff. What are the, some of the more interesting things you found? And let's start with the most, like the craziest thing. And then we'll go into what looked really legit until you dug into it. That's the second one. So the craziest is the story. I'm actually going to tell a story of a friend only because I really want to get the shock value. So I had a buddy, bought a business, like a HVSC type business, home service business, about $3 million in purchase price, used to SBA loan. He wasn't able to talk to the employees before, before he got into the business. 
And we were talking about this a little bit, but he's riding around with the sales dude trying to get like accustomed to where the customers are and where the centers of influence are. And he hits him with a question like, hey, so how do you sell? And what if I wanted to like double sales next year? And the guy responds, well, maybe you should hire more prostitutes. You're kidding, Ooh. right? Nope. <laughs> nope. So that's one interesting one that's really catchy. But like, here's a couple of ones that are more recent. So I had a company that was selling. It was a sure entrepreneur who had started three businesses and was moving on to a sport. He had a management team in the business, which everybody loves because they can pass their bank down. <laughs> so uh, there's like five people that all have been in digital marketing and executive level for like 15 years. And so I'm going through diligence and the numbers on the financials checked out. Right. But I'm looking at the management team and I'm like, hold on. Each of them is pulling $60,000 out of this. You couldn't replace these folks for under 150 K salary, 200 K all in. So that's like 150 K per you're talking like $700,000 of EBITDA that really isn't there, that if you hadn't really thought about what it would take to replace these people, you wouldn't have found it. And then I was talking to my client and I'm like, hey, if you know anything about equity, you'll understand this. If I'm working with a serial entrepreneur for three companies, I probably have some equity, whether it's real or like goodwill equity with the owner. So am I going to go work for some new schmuck and not get any equity or go run to my former bosses who I've been with for 10 years, his new thing and get some equity? Those guys are going to be out of the door in three minutes. Yeah. So we stopped the deal. And once again, that's not financial diligence. That's operational diligence. That dog wasn't going to hunt. One of the things I like to look at is you can actually look at like history. So if you look at the key players, say, say you got a software engineering company and your lead engineer has a team of six people. I go to his LinkedIn page, look at his last six or seven jobs write them all down. And then I go to his whole team and look at everybody on there. Right. And where, where there's last six jobs. Cause I, I was in IT. I know this works this way. When I would go from one company to the next, I record re re my guest guys. I brought them with me. Not even just like intentionally right off the bat, but they just knew that if they ever needed a job, if they ever wanted to switch, I'll write a job description for you and I'll make one for the top two or three guys. There's a guy right now. I mean, Manoj called me for a job right now. I'd go buy a tech company. I'd buy something that guy could, I'd figure out a way to raise funds, buy a tech company and put him to work because he's the best, best Oracle DB I've ever seen in my life. There's a certain people out there like you would jump over hoops for. I love what you just said there in the, if your key guy leaves, who's he taking with him? And, and what are their incentives? People get so caught up in their own, that management team that's there. They're not incented to go be your employee. I seen one here recently, it's about two years ago now. Uh, we were looking at an engineering company. The owner was 78, he really wanted to retire, son didn't want it. And then I looked around, I finally got to see his work chart. And a lot of the names reminded me of like my grandfather's name. They were old school names. And I started thinking, what's the real demographics here? So I just asked the guy, I said, do you mind? I know this is a weird question because he kept telling me, all my executives have been with me for 20 years. Like, who are, yeah. what's their age? 75, 76, one of them was 82. I was like, the only right. reason those people are staying around is the loyalty to him. When he retires, right. they all retire. So I had to yeah. ask him, I said, I need to talk to every single one of them. And he says, why? I said, I honestly think they're all going to retire the day after you do. I said, I bet if you were truly honest with me, the reason you're selling this and retiring is they're telling you it's time. They're done. I was like, this is an engineering company of like 25 people and the top eight are going to leave. You got a problem, man. So let me double click on that because this isn't talked about enough. And this is why I started this business. So let's just say you were a novice and didn't know to ask that. And you would have written up in your one pager to the banks and to your equity folks, strong management team, 20 years experience with the founder, 10 years experience outside. And you would have bought that thing for whatever, call it a million bucks, put a personal guarantee on the loan. And then all those folks would have retired the day after you finished the deal. You'd be without a management team. I guarantee you all those people were the relationships that kept the sales going and you'd have an engineering less engineering company and you'd be essentially creating a startup engineering company to just go pay X is the name bank. Right. And so when people try to pull stuff on my clients, I stay professional, but sometimes it's almost like fighting words. Like you were trying to bankrupt me. Lucky for me, I had a really good, they sold it now, but I had a really good friend. Actually, I hired him, he became a friend after I hired him to be my performance coach. 
So uh, he's the one that got me kind of in this space. I was doing real estate, and one day he's like, with everything you know, you should be playing a bigger game. I could flip a freaking house with my real estate firm, put $40,000 in our business account, and I still hear his voice in the back of my head. But you should be playing a bigger game. So I got into this space. But uh, his soon-to-be ex-wife now, his wife actually owned a headhunting firm that they sold that would hunt recruit, recruited engineers. So I just oh. called him up and said, hey, if I lost the top four or five engineers, what's the cost to do the search and how long does it take? And he says, well, you'd be paying us at least a third of the salary, 30 to 40,000. Their salary is this, and it takes six months sometimes to find a good one. So I was like, okay, so this business isn't going to survive, especially if they all leave within the same year. It's right. going to take me six months to find a qualified engineer to replace them, paying a search firm to do it. I thought maybe I had an insight that you can negotiate a better price. And I have an insight because I have a recruiting firm. That's all they did. And they found engineers. It's like, maybe I can solve so this. And nobody it, else can. You can't put it together. And no, that's one of the hardest things for my clients oftentimes is just, how do I say this? In corporate worlds, let's say I'm supposed to go work with, I'm Home Depot and I'm going to do a partnership with Lowe's or something. And it makes sense for both sides. And we're talking about it. And once we start spending real money, because yeah. like these tens and twenty thousands of dollars that individuals invest are probably hundreds of thousands of dollars for corporations. Once they start spending that kind of money, most times something happens. Something consummates because nobody wants to hold the bag on that quarter million dollar, million dollar investment in something that they didn't go. But in SMB deals, man, you invest time just to find out it's a complete farce. And your best bet is running away and going and finding the next one. Because like when you try to figure out how to make your past sunk cost like activity work. It's like, well, how do you do a six month thing? You'd almost have to have the current owner spend the money, replace the engineers, and then sell the business. And if he did that, he wouldn't sell it to you at the price that he's selling it at with a whole new other price. And who wants to take on that risk at 78? He's gonna have to probably wind this thing down or sell it differently. And I struggle at times with a lot of clients that they're not used to switching gears that quickly. Yeah, I tell you what I did with those guys because I made friends with the owner. He was a really cool guy, seventy eight. He didn't. I wouldn't say he was like offered all the information. He told me what he wanted to tell me, but he never. If I asked him a question, he reminded me of my father. If you ask him something, he'd tell you the brutal, honest truth about what's going on. Right. But if you didn't ask, he just told his story, which is I can respect to some extent. So. When it came down to it, I was like, look, guy, I can't buy this. And I was working with somebody else. I was like, he can't buy it. I said, the only play you have here is you've got to do strategic. It was a pretty good size. It was out of Dallas. And I said, and your only play here is a strategic. You got to go find somebody that already has the engineers and staff, and they just want your client list. And they'll keep your junior engineers. It'll be around. They don't want to hear your senior engineers' opinions anyway, so they'll be glad that they're gone. And yeah. that's your play here. I like as for finders fee, I'll go make the introductions for him, but I think you already know him. He's like, yeah, I didn't want to sell to my competitors. They've been at it for a long time. I said, now's the time to give that up because that's your best buyer. Like, go make friends with those guys. Well, go get paid. I mean, it's not you doing that deal. Now you're being nice and being his investment banker or broker and saying, here's how you can salvage some value or achieve some value rather yeah. out of this. And I think, look, man, there's another story I'll tell you. So I got a client. So most time we look at EBITDA as the metric for valuation, sales discretionary earnings, one of the two. But the reason we look at that is because it's the lazy man's cash flow. All that really matters is cash flow, but cash flow is hard to calculate. Well, in asset heavy businesses, manufacturing, trucking, those kind of things, really you got to look at EBITDA minus CapEx because the CapEx is so high that it affects cash flow tremendously. So a $2 million EBITDA business may be under a million dollars of EBITDA minus CapEx. Well, some brokers have put together a package on a trucking company blasting it's like $6 million of EBITDA, right? And one of my clients was a novice and rightfully got me to help him with diligence. And the first thing I'm saying is like EBITDA isn't the valuation metric. Like your X times EBITDA, like there should be EBITDA minus CapEx. Well, what's CapEx? Oh God, <laughs> we're in for what? So yeah. we go in there, show them what CapEx is, show them that the EBITDA minus CapEx is truly more close to value, but then the sellers and the broker and the seller CPA were in cahoots and they were trying to artificially boost the profit by not doing the work to consolidate two entities and forcing us to do it with far less data than we should, hoping we wouldn't catch it. So all of a sudden on top of the EBITDA minus CapEx, which is like $800,000 difference now, 
there's a five hundred thousand dollar hole in EBITDA that they keep trying to move where depreciation was and move where the owner's selling. But it was five hundred k. These jokers showed up six months after the sim was published, two months after the letter of intent was signed. They're like, oh man, wait, we got five hundred thousand dollars worth of prepaid. We forgot to tell you about, man. Here you go. And I'm sitting on this call, Ron, and I'm like, do we just hang up on these folks? <laughs> you know what I mean? Had it been my deal, I'd have been done right there. Like, respectfully, I'm just going to end this. Now, we finally, I think, got to a better place. But you got to understand, I had to tell my client this, and you'll appreciate this, Ron. And I hope if you're listening and you're trying to transition into this, you hear this. My client was probably more interested in finding a way that everybody could be happy than making sure he didn't go bankrupt in the deal. So he was telling me what the broker was saying, what the seller was saying, what the owners were saying. And I was like, so none of them have the $10 million to go buy this. And if you want to test it, tell them if they want to pay that high price on that business to go half with me and you'll see how quickly they don't have the capacity to. And understand that doing well by them is bankrupting you. This is one of those, I'm not going to call it zero sum, but pretty close games. So you actually have to assert your selfish capitalistic interest in ways that you might not be used to. I get that. Yeah, I get that. So I have the mentality of the, from my previous role in the real estate world is everybody gets an offer, right? Everybody gets an offer. You may not like the offer and my offer stands until you fix it. So I'll give you kind of a little synopsis or a story, I guess. The favorite thing I like to do in the beginning is when the owner starts telling me what they need or what they want for a business, my natural instant response is cool to see how we can get you there. And then we go through everything. We do our things. And I always tell people, it's like, look, I've interviewed over a hundred and hundred plus 160 people now, over 160 people. I know this industry. I know a lot of people in the industry. If I'm not your buyer. I probably know somebody would be interested in it. Let's just go down and let's hear the story. Let's figure out what you're trying to do. And if it's not me, I'll point you in the right direction. I'll keep moving. So it gives me more leads by just like the, Hey, I'm open to hear about it. And the problem with that is I've got a couple and I'm also a natural born empath. So meaning I feel people's emotions and their stress and their pain. And I want to solve the problems for them. Yeah. I've made a few offers before. I'm kind of glad they didn't accept. We had one where I say the story a lot on the show. There was a concrete plant that was, I forgot what the numbers were. It was in the tens of millions of revenue. The last year, I see in their books, they claim they only had 15,000 or 15,000 of profit on, a, I think, a $19 million revenue. We got digging into this thing. The books were a mess. And there were stories of one of their divisions went down because a relative had embezzled the money. I was 90% sure the sister of the two partners, was she was doing it too. The CEO had, she didn't know. And I actually had, I pulled them aside towards the end. I said, look, you need, really need to have your books audited by a third party. In six months, we've never received a clean set of them. We barely receive anything. It's mixed. It's a mess. It's the messiest thing I've ever seen. She goes, are you going to make an offer? It's like, sure. Offered them a dollar down and take over their debt. All right. Yeah. And to buy 60% of the company and let them participate in 40% of the back end when we fix it. Because it was a third generation company. But I'm kind of glad they didn't because, I mean, I had to build an entire team around that. They had trouble with the IRS. We already had like started the process to retain a, a tax attorney to fix that because they never contested it. We were looking at forensic CPAs to go in and audit the books and fix the books. Anyway, I like what you just said. Sometimes you just got to be able to look, this is going to bankrupt me. I can't give everybody an offer, right? The offer here is go find somebody else. And I think, look, Ryan, what I love about this and even fellas hanging out back in college looking for our wives. You can get five dudes that have five different smart opinions about the same thing, right? And depending on the situation, different people are winning. So let me say this, Ron's right, I'm right. Three other dudes that came up here are right. I think what people have to think about is what is your opportunity cost of spending three years fixing somebody else's mess? And how hard will they push you inertia-wise because they got in the mess because they couldn't fix it and do the painful stuff themselves. And I'll tell you another thing I get a lot of times, Ryan, how many times do you think people call me for QOE, say they want to start, but they tell me the books are simple. It's a simple business, <laughs> clean. I trust the owner. <laughs> 80, 85%. Oh yeah. This is going to be easy for you, man. I mean, I want a discount because this is going to be, this shouldn't take you much work at all. I just want a second set of eyes. All yeah. the time. And I'm like, Hey, my disposition is I want, to keep goodwill in the ecosystem. So it's funny, I think my thing with offers is I do that with clients. I'm like, hey, 
if you're thinking that it's simple, I'm probably not the solution because I'm not the cheapest. I think I'm the best. However, I'll tell you, out of the last 10 deals I've done, seven were clean financials, trust the owner, really simple. And half of those didn't close because they didn't pass QOE. And they didn't pass for reasons that not even a investment banker off of Wall Street would have found. And that's why I do what I do. What? So the other thing that happens is people get into deals that the owners are familiar to them. So I have a current client who was working at a business run by a family office, and now he's looking to do a search and the family office is going to back him on the search. But then the family office taps him and says, hey, well, why don't you buy this asset that we already own? Red flag one. <laughs> this one's part owned by us, part owned by an entrepreneur who we think is making too much money off of us and not really pushing the agenda to get this thing growing. So you got to negotiate with him and he's a little hostile, red flag two. Then red flag three, he's like, I'm just financial enough to kind of kick the tires on these things, but I don't really understand due diligence or even like stock versus assets. And I'm like, gosh, dude, this would be the perfect time to pass on a whole bunch of debt to you through a stock sale because you think it's all familiar parties and they offload this thing to you. And now not only do you work for them, but you work for the bank. And because everybody knows each other, you're going to want to not do the work, not read the legal document, not ask the question. And you're in like shark lurking waters here. And I hope this is the greatest deal you ever do, but you almost need more protection, not less, because you're going to, your senses are going to be depleted or sort of run down because you know these folks. So uh, the bigger deals, like in history, like $25 million and up, they do reps and warranties and there's an insurance policies for them on the reps and warranties deals, right? Yeah. There's just now a company they're underwritten by Lloyd's of London, I think out of the big guys, but there's just, I think there's only two people that I know of in the United States selling it, but there's actually reps and warranties for these small deals now and uh, not very expensive worth doing. But in a case like that, not only do but I want somebody like you to go through it and like, okay, I didn't find anything. Probably ought to have a pretty decent reps and warranties thing. Usually the policies are bought by the seller, though. You might want something like that just because it covers all the hidden agenda, or you just move on. Well, I could agree with you more. If security is available at a reasonable price, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars on a mm -hmm. million or $10 million deal. Like, don't no. be a dummy. Nobody sits like, hey, man, I'm so glad I saved that $10,000 on this million dollar deal that's going sideways. Like, no. And the other thing that people don't get, hey, is the engine and the transmission good in that car you're selling, Ron? Okay, it's a $3,000 thing. You know what I mean? What do I get for lying to you? A thousand bucks? Now we're talking about $800,000 SDE at a four times multiple. So that $100,000 thing that they could lie about is actually a $400,000 thing. Even people full of integrity get lured into lying in this environment. And then on top of the lies, Ryan, a lot of times people just don't know. Like I've seen stuff in diligence that it wasn't a malicious lie, but rather a high school level controller, a owner that graduated high school, sold trucks for 10 years, started a trucking company, and now it's worth a couple million bucks. And an accountant that gets paid 1500 bucks to do taxes and doesn't look at much of anything. And they all just didn't step up above what their competency was. And there's all kinds of stuff that affects cash flow in here that you don't know. One thing I'm going to toss out here, Ron, this has been a really interesting year because a lot of companies had their best year in a long time in 2022 and had been outside of that COVID bump, which a lot of people didn't feel because the government stepped in. Mm -hmm. And it only like a 20 year run up of good, solid economy. And now there's just some question about there's some softness in certain industries and markets that haven't fully been realized. And so I urge everybody listening to be really careful about those sims that were written November, 2022. Right. And first three quarters of 2022 numbers and you're bidding on them and you get in there and they're holding back year to date stuff, or they mm -hmm. don't have the ad backs for the year to date. So they're saying it's about on par. There's a lot of these companies that they're not able to hold up their 2022 performance in 2023. And people are trying to hide it and obfuscate it and make sure as a buyer, you get behind the, get behind the numbers on that. 
And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Are you an entrepreneur or business owner thinking about your exit strategy? Or maybe you've just landed a business through acquisition and the books just aren't the way you need them to be. Let me tell you about Reconciled, your dedicated partner for industry-leading virtual bookkeeping and accounting services. Reconciled pairs you with skilled professionals who empower you to grow your business and prepare for success, whether that's your exit or taking that new acquisition to top performance. Imagine having high-level financial management without expanding your team. From bookkeeping to CFO services, tax advisory, and even fully outsourced accounting, Reconciled has got you covered. They help you make the best business decisions, keeping your end goal in mind. And the best part? Reconciled understands acquisitions as they have acquired three accounting firms in the past three years, and their founder, Michael Lee, mentors others in searching for acquisition, raising capital, or trying to aggressively scale. Reconcile invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconcile.com today and let them get your books in order. Reconciled, making bookkeeping a breeze. That's Reconcile.com something really cool coming up. It's called the Business Acquisition Virtual Summit, July 26th through the 28th. Join Jeremy Harbour, Roland Fraser, Carl Allen, and 20 other leaders in mergers and acquisitions. The event is the 2023 Business Acquisition Virtual Summit. How to Exit is proud to sponsor this 100% online event packed with three full days of expert talks from the world's most recognized acquisition entrepreneurs. Register now at businessacquisitionsummit.com. Be sure to check out their option to do the upgrade to VIP virtual networking so you can meet and talk with the other participants. Don't miss out now on the M&A event of the year. That's businessacquisitionsummit.com. Yeah, I like to, I'm in a different world because everything we do in the media space, the websites, digital sites, newsletters, podcasts, all that that we buy and look at, it's done off a of trailing 12 months. So we use TTM and the multiples are done different too. So instead of buying a, a 3X SDE or EBITDA, we do, it sounds incredibly like, lucrative for the seller because we, we do 36 to 40 2X, but it's of trailing 12 month average revenue. Make the math easy if they're doing $1,000 a month in revenue. The profit margins are so high on these, usually like content sites, blogs, newsletters, and stuff like that. We just go off of that. And it's usually three three years to to just a little over that in revenue. When I look at brick and mortar businesses and stuff like that, I still want to see the trolling 12 months, right? I want to see month by month performance of trolling 12 months. Sure. It, it, it tells a story, right? And the other thing is you don't, a lot of people miss, and I bet you catch this all the time, is not ever seeing cash flows and not knowing that a lot of businesses that you wouldn't think are seasonal are very seasonal. And they're buying them at the wrong time, not realizing they're seasonal. Or people need to be wary of, I'm going to use a fancy term, but I'm going to explain it. So okay. channel stuffing, what the heck is that, Elliot? If I'm selling and I know that I'll likely close because I got you under letter of intent in two months, what stops me if I'm an HVAC from calling all my customers and saying, hey, why don't you pay me up for the next year at a 20% discount or like a landscaping company? I typically go month to month, but hey, man, why don't you do like a rest of year service at a 20% discount? And if I'm an e-commerce business, let me just send double the products to everybody that's paying monthly for the same stuff. No one then in a couple of months to realize that I overbuild them, but it'll all fall on the new owner. And a lot of these companies will like be steady, steady, steady. And then like in the two or three months heading into close, it's like, what the heck is pushing this up? And a lot of times it's artificial. And for folks who haven't run a company and haven't realized what it takes to get 20% growth two or three yeah. months in a row, you don't really, it doesn't let off like your alarm system that this is highly unlikely to be real. I was looking at a security company, like they do home alarm system, security monitoring and stuff. And I didn't realize how cyclical, I don't know if it was all of them, but that one was so cyclical. It was a high crime area. And mm -hmm. when do you have a lot of stuff in your house that people want to steal? Christmas. Yeah. So I'm looking at this thing in January. They had a killer last quarter. And that's all they wanted to really show me. And I kept saying like, no, show me. I need to see the last three years. And I want to see it month by month for the last three years. Well, they're trying to sell it on January at a premium, not knowing that nobody's buying anything from January, February, March. Right. <laughs> they don't have anything in their house that they're worried about people running off with. 
and the news isn't talking about like that's another thing there's a lot of media hype around the christmas time about break-ins picking up so the fear factors there the neighbor's house got broken too and those alarm companies play off that. They watch those scanners and they watch the news reports and they go knock on the door and say, hey, three houses in this neighborhood have been broke into. You want me to install an alarm system? I would have never thought it was cyclical or very seasonal, but it is. And then they always try to push you on, oh, we don't have monthlies, just annuals. I would tell you that is bull. Not a financial system alive that only creates annual financials. And you need to know those things, right? Because if nothing else, even if you bought it right and you have cash in the bank and you can do things, if you don't know that you're you're not going to have much sales in January, February, March, that you know, and you think you got six months worth of operating expenses laying there, and all of a sudden what you really have is probably two or three months because you're not gonna again you're going to be paying salary out of that, right? A lot of people don't see that, but I I want to see a cash flow analysis. I want to see month over month for the last three years and understand. A lot of times I don't even understand it. I'm not an accountant by any means. I've got my master's, in, but my MBA is in business, but it's in marketing. I took enough accounting classes to pass. I, I always say I study everything enough to get my BS meter and go, I'm going to have to have somebody else look at this. A lot of That's times it. cash flow analysis is when I see cash flow statements or I see something, even a lot of these things where it's like they're giving me their profit and loss statements broke up month by month over the last 12 months or something like that so that I can do a trolley 12 months. When I see spikes and dips and stuff, I bring somebody in. I used to have this gal, Kat. She's semi-retired and doesn't really want to do much anymore, but she was a forensic accountant. And a lot of times I would look at things and go, I don't know why this is there or why. And I thought there'd be something wrong. Half the time she'd look at, yeah, people just do it differently. That's fine. Or sometimes she would look at things and go, we really need to dig into this one. This is something's odd here. When she was working in the corporate world, she got flown around. She worked for big corporations and they would send her to divisions that had financial irregular. She was a forensic accountant. She would dig in and figure out where it was going, why it was doing that. She would figure it out, but she just doesn't want to do it anymore. I understand it. I mean, it's tough work. I, I love it. So just so people are clear, I work for self-funded searchers. My average deal size is, it was lower last year. It's about four or $5 million. So mm -hmm. I'm in the SBA lane as well. And each one of my clients are betting a million bucks on a personal guarantee. So even when they get in my behind or I've make a mistake because I'm surely not perfect. I got to respect the client and the risk that they're taking on and also the human that they are. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's willing to go get a chance at wealth and willing to bet a bit and take on some risks. So I'm very happy that I'm in this part of the market. My big deal friends on Wall Street always, well, they used to call me crazy. They don't call me crazy as much anymore, but I love it here. So tell me, I don't know if you're willing to share this or not. Is there a price range or something? So standard SBA, $5 million max loan, and it's a 15, 20 year old company. Everything is, should be easy. What are we looking at in the price range? Is it by hour? Or is it by job? You guys like, I mean, how does it price and what does it cost to do a quality of earnings due diligence workup? So we do fixed fee pricing because I used to hate when I was buying companies and you call an accountant and ask for a price and they give you a rate sheet in like 60 to 160 hours. And I don't know who was going to be working on it. So I don't know. And I'm like, how does a numbers person not know? Mm -hmm. So we're fixed fee. So we charge for deals under $5 million in enterprise value. And we're a little bit flexible on that. We charge $20,000 for our QOE. Like we charge $25,000 for our QOE. And then we have a sort of VIP package for $35,000 that has like projections, key man risk assessment, red flag assessment, and some other things. So we keep it there. And then for deals that are bigger than $5 million in enterprise value, we just increase everything about 5,000 bucks. So it's not a huge increase. And the pricing is all about surety. And right. then a lot of what we do, Ron, is we try to hurry up and get a sense on does the dog hunt. So the first two weeks we're kicking tires, we're looking at bank statements, financials. And most of the time when something is like irregular or sort of totally off, we catch it within the first two weeks. And then we prorate everything around each week mark. So people only have sort of half the bills because we only did half the work to figure it out. Yeah. I was going to ask you that, like, if you pull the trigger early and go, Hey, you guys got to walk from this is the bill difference. So that's cool that you do that. You actually can prorate it and go, Hey, I didn't have to finish this one. I'm going to prorate this one. Let's go find you something else or bring me another one <laughs> because you can get real expensive real fast. If you're, especially if you're a new searcher and you don't know how to do some of that work yourself and have your own BS meter. People ask me all the time, the top questions I always get asked is how much does it cost to do all these due diligences, right? right. And I always kind of knew the ballpark for legal due diligence is around 20K. 
25K yep. for a small SBA. My world's a little skewed because the guys that do the due diligence for web properties and stuff, often it's everything's online and everything's like right there. So I can get like all the technical due diligence done for a web property, a six figure, seven figure web property for probably three or four grand, five grand. And because it's, it's basically, they're just logging into a bunch of stuff. Now the accounting one, that's a totally different, but I didn't know where that number was. And I get asked all the time. The other one is asked, I'm asked all the time is when should I, when should I pull the trigger? And I always say, you want it early enough that you're, you got your LOI signed probably, but you need to have enough information gathered up that you don't have any red flags up because now you're going to start incurring costs. Cause they ask, do they charge me if we don't close or do they get paid at close? I was like, they're putting in hours. They're going to get paid something, no matter whether you close or not, have a pretty good gut feel that this is going to go through. For that concrete plant, I made them an offer. I never brought in anybody to do the, I brought in Kat and some other people, but I did it on equity, potential equity. But we didn't pay any out money out because it was like, I just had to tell people, there's a better chance we don't do this than there is that we are. We're going to keep moving forward. It's a big win if we get it. And if it's a, it's a lot of work, if we get it. And here's the other thing. So if you know how to do some of the analysis, then absolutely do it up front and sort of kick the tires to your level of understanding before you start incurring fees. But if you're just sitting there looking at stuff you don't understand for three weeks, just so you can tell somebody you looked at it, go get some help. I've had clients that are both ways. And then 25% of my sort of client base are like former investment bankers, private equity folks, accountants, bank consultants, whatever. And so a lot of times they could do a lot of the work that I do but they recognize in a 60 or 90 day condensed process to close, they have to go understand the industry, get to know the seller, get to know the employees, get to know the industry, put the debt together, put the equity together. Most of my clients are married, kind of get their family set up in this new location. Think about what a real personal guarantee looks like. And they don't have the time to, to put 40 hours a week for a month into this. So I would say do what you can for sure. But don't wait too long because you can spend two months on a deal where the numbers are off telling yourself that you were waiting to start QOE. And I've got people that call me like, you've got a week of exclusivity left and 30 days to close. Hey man, I found some wonky stuff. Can you do a QOE? And it's like, well, how long I have? Well, a week and a half. Like, <laughs> no, I can't, I can't do that. Now you got to go back and negotiate extensions. What do you say to some of these people? There's, I'm not going to call out any names here because I just don't do that on this show, but there are some gurus out there. There are some people teaching, buying and selling companies that teach. If you're going to do the SBA, you don't have to pay for quality earnings report. You don't have to pay for due diligence because the SBA is going to qualify. You can't qualify for the loan if the finances are not good. I don't think that's true at all. What is your gut feel on like, is the SBA going to find some of the stuff you find? I mean, probably going to find some of it, but they're not going to find some of it. So there's two things that I would say to that. First off, I keep a folder of about 14 stories that have been publicized with people on podcasts and articles where they did diligence themselves, ranted about how smart they were, got into the deal a year, missed a whole bunch of stuff in diligence that got underwritten by the SBA. And now they got a two, three, four million dollar personal guarantee on a business that's they should have only pay it half for. So they have half the cash flow. They're already in trouble with the bank. And now they're like, gosh, I wish I could have rewound this thing back 18 months and not did this deal because now I'm in a financial hole. So I created a sinkhole for myself. The other thing I would say, you got to think about what the SBA is actually underwriting. So let's get real for a second. So this loan product is 90% guaranteed by the government. So 90% of the bank's risk is taken off. Most of these banks sell these loans after a couple of months. So they're not even holding them on their balance sheet. And then what recourse do they have if they underwrite a loan and the buyer can't deliver the money through the company? Well, they like to lend to people that have assets and they personal guarantees will keep you either selling your assets or working a job to pay them. So what the SBA is actually underwriting is a couple of things that the government will backstop them, that the borrower will backstop them. And that their bank will accept the loan. And so do they catch something? Sure. But they're not, they're so covered. They're like double collateralized. I get that. And uh, I've actually heard a few people in our networking groups, like, I'm just going to let the SBA do it. And we're getting the umbrella policy and the insurance company with the key man insurance and everything else. They do their due diligence. Between the two of them, I'm covered. I was like, no, you're not. They're covered. 
<laughs> those guys cover their butts, but you're right. not. Like I explained this, I'm like, here's your gamble. Are you willing to give up everything you guaranteed? Because I've seen some of those SBA guarantees, everything you own, everything you're ever going to own in the future and everything you might think you want to own. <laughs> really broad on like, they start your house, your stocks, your bonds, your investments. I thought I was smart. I have everything in a trust and we have family trust set up and stuff. And like, you got to list that stuff. And then here's the thing. So are security required? No, neither is life insurance. Car right. insurance is regulated by the state, but I know a lot of people that drive without it. They rent a car and don't get the extra insurance. A helmet when you ride a bike. Like there's a lot of dumb things you can do that nobody told you you had to do. Uh, what I'll say is, and I ask this all the time, who, who can lose a million bucks, which is just like your question. And if you're willing to not invest ten, twenty thousand dollars in insurance on your million dollar bet, I'm not even upset. I wish you the best. The people that I deal with recognize that that risk doesn't make sense. Particularly, it'd be different if you were a forensic accountant. Right. You're buying a roofing company and your family's been in roofing for three generations. But a lot of my clients are middle managers in corporate that I love them because they've invested enough and they're thinking about buying a seven figure business in an industry they don't understand and location they don't live. But you're way outside your debt. Get some help. Nobody's going to think about the $20,000 they spent eight years from now. When you bought a solid business, paid it off, you're now a millionaire. And also you could sleep easier because a lot of this stuff, the reason a lot of the banks will call me when I do a QOE is because they didn't figure it out. I tell you, I've interviewed a few people and I know some guys that like own accounting firms. And I say, we talk about due diligence and like, oh, we did our own due diligence for financial. He goes, but I hired an attorney to do the legal due diligence and I brought, I brought an operation. If it was not in their bailiwick, if they bought something like not a, a non-accounting firm, like they would bring in the operational guy and then look at the operations, right? Or they would bring, they get third party opinions on some of those other stuff that they didn't know because they're smart enough. Like it's kind of biased because accountants tend to be risk aware. I wouldn't say adverse, yeah. but they're aware that there's yeah. risk there and they're willing to manage yeah. and make it, mitigate them. But yeah, I've seen accounting firms like, well, yeah, we'll do our own, but we're not doing the legal due diligence. Yeah, I know how it's done. You got to go to every every state that company's ever done business, look at all any pending lawsuits, look at all the contracts. I know what needs to be done, but I'm not qualified to do it. And it's the same way with me. I know what needs to be done in the financial stuff. I, maybe not all the steps, but I have a checklist of due diligence items. But am I qualified to look at something and go, yeah, that looks right. Or, oh, that ad back sounds fair. Wait a second. A guy like you would go, yeah, no, you're missing X, Y, and Z. Conversation and accounting words to justify it. Whereas you might smell it and think it's funny, but not have the words mm -hmm. to knock it out and then spend three weeks arguing. And again, one of the things I like about my business, Rod, is years ago, I used to get more calls like, hey, man, like I'm doing a small deal. I don't think I need diligence. So-and-so class that I took said you shouldn't really do diligence on deals under two million bucks. Like, Explain to me why I should do this. And I kind of ended those calls early and just said, hey, if you think that you don't need to do diligence or that you don't need my diligence, then let's just be friends. And if that changes, come back. Because if you have the HISPA to go out there and do a seven-figure deal and not have done it before and not be a forensic accountant and not check those numbers, then, hey, Rocket Man, <laughs> come have fun. I wish you the best. Yeah. I think in some cases where like I do know I, I have at least two mentors that will preach you don't need due diligence, but they're doing like work in WIBO, work in buyout, work in deals where they're coming in, they're putting in work, very little down payment, if any, and they're taking over the business. And within six months, you kind of know what's going on. Within a year, you certainly do. And no money's really changed hands until then. And there's no personal guarantees because they're not doing the different types of loans and stuff. I can see a way to work in without it where your due diligence is I'm going to be an operator for the first 12 months sure. and earn my keep here. But I still think it's dangerous. Now, real quick, a question that was in my head when we were talking about the fees and stuff. Can those be financed in with the SBA loan as part of the purchase package and stuff? Yeah. So if the guy's got, say you've only got $150,000 down, or I guess you need 20%, $100,000 down and some operating costs. So maybe you got $150,000. And I'm going to put 20 to you, 20 to my attorney, 20 to that. Can I finance that stuff back in so I still have operating capital after the acquisition? So it sounds like we can. Yeah. I didn't know for, I don't think I've ever asked anybody of that, but it's good to know we can. And then, so like you said, we have real hours so we have to get paid. So I charge half when we start, half when we finish our work, but I'll refund the money 
and get paid through the deal. So you can finance the fees that you pay me. So it's almost like a deposit that you get back when the deal closes. Okay. So let's do something real quick. Before somebody comes to you, they're about to do their LLI. What do you think they should look at as financials? Kind of a 50,000 foot view. You should look at X, Y, and Z and be comfortable with this before you do an LOI. And what I'm looking for is do these steps before you call me, but then I need to take over at this particular point. Sure. So I would say you're only going to get probably 10 to 20% more than what the broker sends you initially. The whole, I wish that I look at pre-LOI, I I would actually say that you should look at what the broker gives you, realize everybody's looking at that and bid based on that. If you're doing a a proprietary deal, then I think you want the last two years tax returns, last three years financials. And I think a description of the business, if you don't fully understand it, it may be marketing material, it may be a conversation. I think that's enough to get to an LOI. We do free LOI reviews on offer from Elliot.com. So you can sort of, if you're worrying about how to think about your LOI, you can come and sign up for one of those. And then once the LOI is signed, then I think you start asking for the other stuff. And what I'll say is a lot of my clients try to over-engineer the pre-LOI analysis. And I would commit to you that the pre-LOI stuff is probably plus or minus 20 to 40%. So use it as a guide, but just know that you're going to really get behind the kimono after LOI. Okay. So uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Let's tell people how to get a hold of you. I think you actually uh, had a free offer for the people. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So let's do that. Sure. So guardian due diligence.com is where you can find me. Also I'm King of QOE or Elliot E Holland on Twitter. That's my number one social. So I'm very active on there. If you need your LOI review, we do that for free at offerfromelliot.com. And then we have lots of programs to help you get moving. So we have a pre-LOI program that's free or small investment to kind of help people get their LOI signed. And we have a pretty self-serve website. So there's like 14 to 15 downloads. We've got over 150 articles, YouTube channel. So there's a lot of stuff you can consume and we'd love to sort of hear from you. Awesome. Awesome. And if somebody could walk away today with maybe two or three key points, and that's all they remember from the show, what would you have them? What would you want them to remember? Don't be a dummy and bet a million dollars without due diligence. Seriously, I don't want to hear anybody else on these podcasts talking about, they say ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and lost a million. You got to be spree smart in this environment, which is why I think Ryan and I are kind of going back and forth on some of our fancy degrees didn't help us all that much and some of the things that we do now. So If you don't kind of have some of that negotiating street smarts, recognize that you're going to have to learn it quickly. And then the third, I would just say is there's a huge ecosystem of people like myself, like Ron, others that are putting out free content for you to learn from and are way more accessible than my former private equity colleagues. So leverage the network to learn as much as you can take lessons from other people's failures and get out there and succeed. That's what I leave them with. Awesome. Well, I think we'll call that a show, and I appreciate you for being here today. Ron, thanks for having me, man. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show, ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale, and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business, you're ready to sell. 
I want you to visit the IT exchange net.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now